Good evening and welcome to our Midweek Lenten service for this evening. We begin with hymn number 815, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. Hymn number 815 in the back of your worship. In 
the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, and though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the first chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, beginning with the 21st verse. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me, you may have ample calls to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And a reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And so to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day long? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the, his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last work only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last would be first, and the first last. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. A couple of announcements that we share quickly with you, and that is a reminder that next Wednesday is our last midweek Lenten service for this year. Uh, we will be studying the prodigal of the parable of the two sons. It also will be our last meal before uh, this Wednesday night service. The reason, of course, being the following week is Holy Week, 
and on Holy Week with services on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday at 2 and 7 here in the sanctuary. We do not have a Wednesday night service. So I know it's hard to believe, but the last midweek Wednesday night service is next Wednesday. Easter is almost here. The other announcement is to remind you Saturday night before you go to bed, be sure and move your clock up one hour or you will be coming to church when the rest of us are leaving church. So don't be caught uh, not having moved your clock ahead. Spring forward. So next week at this time, it'll be 8.10 instead of 17. Uh, so please remember uh, to do that. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As we examine the parables of Jesus, we see that sometimes the parables are those which apply to or can apply to anybody, whether they are a Christian or not. Especially like last week's parable when we talk about forgiveness and the, the need to be able to forgive. Uh, some of the other parables about treating people uh, in a proper way or having love for one another. Those go beyond the boundaries of the church. But other parables deal strictly with the community of faith. They deal with or they illustrate God's relationship with us and what happens to a person when they become a part of the community of faith. And that is what we have today. Today we have a parable which the world's viewpoint is that it is very unfair. The world's viewpoint is that there is no way, if you want to have a successful business, that you pay somebody who worked one hour the same as you pay somebody who worked 12 hours. In the days of Jesus, the work hour was from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And it was divided into four three-hour increments. And so as we look at the parable, we see the master going out at different hours in these four different increments in order to find people to work in his vineyard. As we examine this parable as Christians, however, we see that there is fairness in the master's action. The master represented God, of course. We see the fairness because in this parable, it is revealed to us the grace of God. And as followers of Jesus, we know that because of our sinful actions, God does not owe us anything. That the only thing God owes us is his wrath, his punishment, to shove us out of his existence. But this parable demonstrates that for those who come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, that there is a different action by God. You cannot pay a person for doing good or being good. The only reward is being part of God's kingdom and doing God's will so that at the end of your life you hear God say, well done good and faithful servant. So what is your reaction to God's generosity? Let us again look at the parable. For the kingdom of heaven, and there's the key, the kingdom of heaven. So this is a parable for believers. Those who do not believe in Jesus do not believe in the kingdom of heaven. Or not in the kingdom of heaven as Jesus is playing. They may believe in some kind of nirvana, they may believe in some kind of paradise, but it is different than what Jesus describes for us. And what is different is also that you have to earn that nirvana or that paradise of the other religions. But for the kingdom of heaven, for those who believe in Jesus, is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, they sent him into his vineyard. So these people were hired at 6 a.m., the first increment, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Then he goes out the third hour, 9, the end of the first increment, and sees others standing, he hires them. Then he goes to the sixth hour, which is 
the end of the second increment. Then he goes out again at the ninth hour, which is the end of the third increment, and hires them and tells them to go into the vineyard. Then he goes back into the marketplace, and it's the eleventh hour. And he sees these men standing, and he says, Why do you stand, all, stand here idle all day? That is, why are you not working? Or why have you been deprived of work? And they answer, well, no one would hire him. So he says, well, go in my vineyard and work as well. So these fellows are going in to work one hour. That's all they're going to be working. So the day comes to an end. The 12th hour comes, 6 o'clock. Work day's over. The master tells the foreman to line everybody up, beginning with those who are hired at a, the 11th hour to be first and those who are hired at 6 a.m. to be last. And the foreman begins to pay them and pays them on a denarius, which was a nice day's pay. Well, those who were hired at the beginning, they're seeing those hired at the end making the same amount of money, and they're thinking, oh, we're going to make more in that since we worked longer than he did, than they did. But then when it comes to them, they are only given a denarius as well. And they begin to groan. Just like the world grumbles at the generosity and grace of God. Because the world is built on the standard of earning. The world is based on the standard of you only receive what you earn. If you work hard, then you should be rewarded. If you don't work hard, then you shouldn't be rewarded. If you go out with an arrogant attitude that you're owed something, then you're going to end up with nothing. So they grumble at his generosity. And he challenges them. He says, take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Now this master, of course, represents God. The laborers are sinners. The laborers are us. The denarius or the invitation to work is God's invitation of salvation through grace by faith. He is saying, come to me and have salvation. And so those who were hired at 6 a.m., they represent those of us who belong to the church from our birth. Those of us who were born to Christian parents who were brought to church and baptized and at three or four years old we began Sunday school and then that, uh, depending on the church you grew up in but having grown up Lutheran all my life that's my experience. Twelve and a confirmation class for two years. Three hours every Saturday for two years. Uh, then you're confirmed. Once confirmed you're considered an adult member of the church continued through Sunday school until you graduated from high school. Then if, in my case, you went off to college, then when you would come back and go to church with your family when you were home for the short breaks, um, you didn't go to Sunday school anymore because you didn't have a class and you were only going to be there uh, two or three weeks before you would be going back to the university. So I, they didn't usually mess with a college age class unless you happen to live in a town that had a lot of commuter students who then maybe they would have a Sunday school class. But then you go to college, you get a job, you get married or go on a career and you go to church and you spend your whole life in church and you know that you have that promise of everlasting life. Well then along comes the person who doesn't become a Christian until maybe in midlife. They grew up in a home that was not a Christian home. As when they were growing up, they weren't taken. No one took them to church. They heard about Jesus from their friends. They saw preachers on TV. They knew basically the idea of something about Jesus and salvation and sin. But it wasn't until midlife that they become a Christian and they spend the rest of their life serving Christ and serving His church. And then you have the 11th hour hirings. And those are the deathbed confessions. Those are the people who have resisted 
the call of God for salvation their entire life for one reason or another. Again, maybe it was they weren't brought up in a Christian environment. They were never around Christian people. They hung around with the wrong crowd. And it's not until they're on their deathbed that some uh, benevolent, loving chaplain or a Christian happens to find out about them and shares the good news with them and they become a Christian right before they die. The way the world sees this, it is not fair for the person on the deathbed to receive the same thing as people like me who've been a Christian ever since they were baptized at six weeks old. The world says I should receive more than that person on the deathbed confession because I serve the Lord long. But the parable is telling us that that's not how God acts. That God doesn't act the way the world acts. That God acts out of grace. And that is important to remember because if God is going to have grace towards one of us, in order to have grace towards all of us, he has to treat us as son. Because as St. Paul reminds us in Romans, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So if we're all sinners, then either God condemns us all, or he provides a way of salvation that now allows all of us to enter into his kingdom, into that mansion prepared for us by Jesus Christ himself, to sit down at the banquet feast which has no end, to be in that new Jerusalem where there is neither death nor grief nor crying nor pain for the old order of things have passed away. And so that is a point in the parable of asking you, what is your reaction to that? Will you become a follower of Jesus Christ and stay a follower of Jesus Christ when you know this is God's way of acting? Or are you going to be so filled with the world that you are upset that God would do this? When he asks him, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me or do you begrudge me? Uh, the word allowed literally means to something to be legal uh, or to be its purpose. The word begrudge means to be wicked or to be malicious, uh, to be violent. Um, in other words, I, Jesus or is saying, or God is saying as the master, if you wanted to put it in a more a direct, literal translation from the Greek, he's saying, it is legal, proper, and permitted since I am God, for me to be generous, that is benevolent to all, and you should not have wicked or malicious feelings because of my benevolence, since that benevolence shines on you as well as on your imperfections. So God is saying, if you complain against my generosity, you have no standing. My generosity, my grace, my benevolence shines on you and your imperfections and still takes you in as a member of the kingdom, as a member of the community of faith, as a child of the Heavenly Father. Now, over the centuries, this parable sometimes has been misused. Some have tried to use it as a justification for being on one side or another of a labor dispute. This parable has nothing to do with set wages. This parable has nothing to do with labor laws. This parable has nothing to do with labor relations. It has nothing to do with whether or not a union should be allowed to strike or not strike. It has nothing to do with who sets a minimum wage or not. It deals strictly with the grace of God and the kingdom of heaven and God's relationship with us through that faith in Jesus Christ. It is emphasizing the fact that God deals with all of us in the same way. And I am sure, if you are honest with yourself, that like me, you have had those times when a Christian has done something to you that hurt you, and when that happens, you think that that Catholic idea of purgatory sounds pretty good. You know, why should 
this person get to go straight to heaven when they gave me nothing but heck for 15 years? You know, let them spend a couple of hundred years in purgatory before. Let them get refined by that fire. You know, let them get a little toasty before they're allowed to go up and keep them at it. But see, God doesn't act that way. Again, that's the world thing. God instead is generous to all. As followers of Jesus Christ, we do not grumble, but we are grateful. Grateful that God sees what we need and acts on that need instead of our useless wants and overblown action, successes. So God acts on what we need, and that is salvation. That is a way of bringing people to him. He says he as a holy God cannot be in the presence of sin. He cannot tolerate sin. This is why when Moses went up on Mount Sinai and God was going to cross from one mountain to the other, he put his hand in the cleft of the rock so that Moses could not see it. Because had Moses looked upon the face of God, he would have died being a sinful person. So God was doing what Moses needed, blocking that vision. Jesus came to give us that true vision of what who God is and what he is like. To show us what God is really all about. So God, in order to be good to one, is good to all. Now this parable shows us and describes for us and illustrates for us a God who is totally different than the gods of Eastern religions. This is not the God of Buddhism or Hinduism or Taoism or Confucianism or Sikhism or any of the other Eastern religions. It is not the God of Eastern mysticism. It is not the God of the cults. It is not the God of Islam. The God of Islam is not a God who wishes to have a relationship with us through Jesus Christ and save us by grace through faith, but is instead is a God in whom you must earn that salvation and is a God who will, for no reason, cause something ill to happen to someone and therefore, because it is Allah's will, you are doing nothing to prevent it from happening. Now I've explained this to you before. A friend, uh, a parishioner of the second congregation I served had been in the Army Corps of Engineers, worked over in Saudi Arabia. They could not get the Saudi Arabians to do any of the safe, normal safety procedures that we use in America. They would not even consider any of the OSHA manuals. They worked on a construction site. They wore no steel helmets. If a wrench fell from five stories and came down and hit somebody in the head and killed them, that was all I was doing. Even though that metal hat would have saved their life. If they were a steel worker up walking a steel beam and they didn't have a harness for safety and the wind came and blew and blew them off that beam and they tumbled 20 stories down into death, even though that death could have been prevented by that harness, it was Allah's will. So this is not the God of Israel. Although this is the God and father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though this is the God of Moses and the God of King David, unfortunately, over the centuries, the Jewish rabbis and Theologians and scholars did not see that the key to the relationship with God was faith like Abraham, but instead thought the key was abiding by all these laws and rituals that must be done perfectly in order to enter into the kingdom of God. And so the God of the Old Testament does not come across as this God who is so willing for us to be saved and to have a relationship with him that he does 
the most drastic step possible to enable us to be part of his kingdom. And that is, of course, sending his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Saved through him through that suffering and death of all the cross. Saved through his blood that paid the debt of sin that we hold so bad. That blood washes us clean so that God does not see sinners in the hands of an angry God, but in the earth to the kingdom and child of the heavenly Father. This parable emphasizes how God wanted this relationship and continues to want this relationship. And so he does not act like the world acts. Sunday, for those who are college basketball fans, the biggest, one of the biggest days of the year, Selection Sunday, you find out if your college made it or didn't make it. The selection committee goes into a room, they set up a certain criteria of what makes you eligible for the tournament. They pick 68 teams. There's always a debate afterward if this team really shouldn't have gotten in, this team should have gotten in instead of that team. But it's by human arbitrary judgment. A bunch of human beings decide whether this win was better than that win or this loss worse than that loss. So this 20 and 12 team enters a tournament while this 20 and 12 team stays home. So that's how the world does things. You have to earn it. And they set the criteria. But God does not do that. God acts out of grace. And this parable wants us to be aware of that grace. This parable wants us to understand that grace. This parable wants us to understand how God acts towards his people. And that is through faith in Jesus Christ, we are his children. We are his heirs. Not because of anything we do, but because of everything that Jesus Christ did. So this is a parable for the church. This is a parable for the community of faith. This is a parable that we proclaim to the world. To let them see that a relationship with God is not based on rules and regulations and rituals, but it's based on having a simple faith in the suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. That salvation comes through believing in the death of Jesus Christ in his burial, that on the third day he rose, and when he rose, he defeated sin, death, and the power of the devil for all time. That is what this parable is all about. To reassure you of that love of God. To assure you of how great that love is, that even when you stumble and fall, that God is still there to take you back. That like the prodigal son, we recognize our sin, we turn back to God, we confess, and the blood of Christ worship that sin away so that though our sins be like scarlet, we are now white as snow. So the parable of the workers in the vineyard. To an outsider, it seems like the master should be hauled before the labor relations board and find thousands of not millions of dollars for poor labor practices. But that's the world. That's not God. God acts differently. The thief on the cross, the penitent thief on the cross, received the same glory as St. Peter and St. Paul and St. James and St. John and St. Thomas and St. Andrew and St. Barnabas and St. Mark and St. Luke and all of us followers of Jesus Christ ever since. Although he did not repent and believe in Jesus until hours before he died, that same grace was given to him. That is the God that we should respond to with joy and eager commitment, eager to serve him and to share his good news with others. The world will complain. Let the world complain. For 
It doesn't matter whether we see, serve Jesus all our life or we are a late country to grace. All is done to the glory of God. And all is done so that we might have salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us now sing, Lord Jesus, think on me, hymn number 599, in the back of our worship books. Hymn number 599.
As we seek, as we seek in this Lenten time to grow in our faith, let us pray for the life of the world. Our response this evening is, hear our prayer. That the church in every place work faithfully in its ministry of reconciliation as ambassadors for Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. That those preparing for baptism be welcomed like the prodigal son with celebration and rejoicing for the forgiveness and new life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. That the governments of the world may be just and fair, from presidents to tax collectors, from ambassadors to civil servants. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. That those who are estranged might find reconciliation through Christ, and that we might be generous toward them with our inheritance from God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. That God's wings of healing might hover over those who are weak and ill. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. That this congregation might be like manna in the land, providing relief for those in need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. That we, together with all the faithful departed, might celebrate the new creation that is ours in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant these prayers, merciful God, and all that we need as we eagerly await the Easter feast through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless, comfort, and strengthen you now and forever. Amen. 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 We conclude our worship with children of the Heavenly Father, hymn number 781, in the back of your worship book. Hymn number 781. <laughs> That concludes our Wednesday midweek Lenten service. Next Wednesday will be the last Wednesday midweek service for Lent. And then the following week will be Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday for Holy Week. 
We hope to see you then. Goodbye.